All right, thanks for everybody for sticking around for our final keynote of the day. I want to introduce Alberto Cairo. Uh, Alberto Cairo is the director of the visualization program at the University of Miami's Center for Computational Science. Cairo's other published works include The Functional Art, an Introduction to Information Graphics and Visualization, and The Truthful Art, Data, Charts, and Maps for Communication, and How Charts Lie, Getting Smarter About Visual Information, which is set to be released uh, the fall of this year. So I'd like to give Alberto a quick hand. All right, is this microphone working? Do you hear me? Yes? Okay, perfect, great. Well, very happy to be here today. It's an honor to talk to you about um, how charts lie, or better said, uh, perhaps that would be a better title for both the talk and the book, how we lie to ourselves with charts, how we mislead ourselves, so ourselves whenever we see a map, a data visualization, a graph of different kinds, we tend to misinterpret them very, very often. And this is what my new book is about. And what you are going to witness today is basically a trailer for the book. I'm going to give you ba basically the gist of the story and the many reasons why I believe that we so often misinterpret charts, even those of us who are well trained into designing charts. I have been designing charts all my life, all my professional, professional career. I began my career in Spain. I'm originally from northern Spain, from a region called Galicia. I began my career in journalism, working for several media organizations, such as El Mundo, which is the second newspaper in terms of circulation in Spain. At the time, I used to produce pictorial visualizations, visual explanations of information, like you do a 3D model of a car if there is an accident, for example, and you need to explain it. We call those kinds of pictorial visualizations in news media infographics. And later on, I uh, moved in a slightly different direction and started getting interested in data visualization, the visual representation of quantitative data. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on um, uh, today. Um, I don't think that I tell you anything new if I say that data visualization has experienced an explosion right, in the past 20 years. This has happened in many, many different realms, the sciences, business analytics, obviously, but also the world of news media. I don't know if you follow news media on a regular basis. You should, everybody should. I think it's a great source of inspiration. But in the past 10, 15, 20 years, uh, all media organizations, particularly newspapers and magazines, have started uh, publishing more data visualizations every day. And the reason why they are doing that is that through their analytics, they are seeing that people, readers, really like charts. Whenever you put a map or a graph or a diagram inside a story, suddenly that story will become more engaging. People will tend to read it more and spend more time taking a look at it. And we have plenty of evidence to, that shows this. Another reason why there has been an, an explosion in data visualization in the past 20 years is that data visualization is useful. If I show you that, if I show you a large you know, quantity of data, and I ask you questions based on this data, it will, be very imp it will be impossible for you to answer those questions. I'm going to tell you what this data set is about. This is a large data set of global temperatures from the year 1000 to the year 2000, measured in Celsius degrees. I'm from Europe, we use, we use Celsius over there. Um, Celsius degrees in comparison to an average, the average of the years between 1961 and 1980. That's the reason why you see negative values and positive values over here. So I'm going to ask you a question based on this data. This is going to be an easy one. Have global temperatures in the past 1,000 years increased or decreased overall? Increased, right? We sort of know that because climate scientists have discovered that, they have created, they have observed climate, they know that temperatures have increased in the past 1,000 years. If you want to answer, if you didn't know the answer to that question beforehand though, right, and if you want, want to answer that question through the data, you will, need to out, you will need to open up that Excel spreadsheet and then scroll up and down to compare the first temperature record to the last temperature record, which is a little bit of work, right? But it's feasible. Now let me ask you a more difficult question. Has at any point in the past 1,000 years global temperatures been higher than they are right now? That is a much harder question to answer only through that. It will force you to again open up the spreadsheet, navigate it, scroll up and down, read every single value and see whether any value in the past is higher than the latest value on the data set, right? Tabular data is hard for us to understand, right? Very, very hard for us to understand. 
It has its purpose, though. There is a reason why we see tables so often in business analytics and in journalism, which is that tables fulfill a very important purpose, which is letting us, letting us see specific values in the data. All right? That table works really well for that. But what, if you want to, what you want to see is overall patterns and trends in the data. A table is not a good way to display this data. It's much better to transform this data into some sort of chart, into some sort of graph. The data that I showed you before is the data that lies behind one of the most influential um, and also, I, I believe, one of the best visualizations in the 20th century called the hockey stick chart, which basically shows you that in the past 1,000 years, global temperatures stayed more or less stable, right? They, they vary, but they vary within a certain range. And it is only at the, beginning of the, at the beginning of the 20th century over there that global temperatures started spiking up very, very rapidly. That's sort of the story that the chart reveals. It is the story that hit behind the data. So another reason why charts, data visualization, I use those two terms interchangeably, right? Well, another reason why charts have become so popular in the past two decades is that they are useful. They let us see, they let us discover insights from the data that may go unnoticed otherwise. Some of the best writers who have written about data visualization throughout the years, for example, famous statistician John Tukey said, or used to say, always visualize your data. Because if you don't visualize your data, if you rely just on summary statistics alone, the median, the mean, the standard deviation, and so on and so forth, you may miss very important features in the data. If you want to analyze the data, it's always good to create some sort of image based on it, or a series of images, right? I'm not telling you anything new, right? Anyway, now I'm going to tell you something new. Let's talk about how visualization is built, right? The main principle behind data visualization, which is going to be critical later on to understanding how we lie to ourselves with visualizations, with charts. Data visualization, or charts, is based on the idea of visual encoding. All that you do when you create a data visualization is that you just you begin with a bunch of data, and then you map those data onto certain objects. We call those objects geoms, right? If they are geometric objects, such as bars, circles, triangles, and so on and so forth. And then what we do is to vary certain properties of those objects in proportion to the data that we are trying to represent. Those properties, those features that vary in proportion to the data are called the encodings, right? And this is the language of visualization. This is what the grammar of visualization is based on, right? The variation of certain properties of objects. So we could begin with a bunch of rectangles and then we can vary the height or the length of those rectangles and we will, we will end up with a, with a bar graph, right? Or we could begin with a bunch of bubbles and then we change the area of those bubbles and the result will be a bubble chart, right? Or we can vary the position of certain objects over a horizontal or vertical axis and we may end up with, for example, a dot plot or things like that, right? Or we may vary the color, right? Color hue, color shape. All these are methods of encodings or also called encodings, right? So I'm going to put you to the test. I'm going to show you a visualization and I'm going to ask you to quickly identify the encodings that you see in that visualization, right? These encodings, right? To identify which one of these are at work in the following visualization. The visualization that I'm going to show you in just a few, a, a few seconds is a visualization about the makeup of newsrooms, of newspaper newsrooms in the United States, whether those newsrooms of major newspapers in the United States have more women or more men on staff. All right, that's what the visualization is going to, is going to show. It is based on data on the, of, uh, data from the American Association of uh, Newspaper Aids or something like that. I don't remember the source. We're going to take a look at the source in just one second. Anyway, what methods of encoding or what encodings can you see in that visualization? What is the first one that you see? Hue, right? Hue, color hue, blue or red. Blue means more men, red means more women, right? That's the data that is encoded, it's zero, one, or one, or the other, right? What else, what other encodings do you see here? Area, very good, I heard area over there, right? Area, the area of those circles is proportional to something, right? The, what is proportional to, sorry about that, I don't know what is making this noise. Uh, I will try to move my head a little bit less and move like Robocop here, right? Let's avoid making a noise. Anyway, so uh, area is encoding the size of the newsroom, right? The bigger the bubble, the bigger the newsroom, or the bigger the newsroom, the bigger the bubble. What else? Shade, color shade, right? The more intense the color, the higher the percentage of either men or women. The bluer the color, more men. The redder the color, more women. 
And another one, there is a most important one perhaps, Position, very good. The position over the horizontal axis is also proportional to the percent of women versus the percent of men. You have the 50-50 split in the middle, and then you have the bubbles that are on one side of the visualization over there. Those are the newsrooms that have more women than men, and then the, the newsrooms that are over here on the left-hand side right, are the newsrooms that have more men than women. Right? So as you can see, there's still a lot of, a lot of work to be done in newspapers. Actually, if we did a similar visualization, not of newsrooms in the United States, but of um, journalism departments or communication departments, the visualization will be the opposite, right? We will have more men than women. Let's use that, yeah, thank you. Okay, perfect. Let's turn this off. Anyway, so, um, I'm going to keep talking. I cannot stop talking, sorry, I love visualization. <laughs> I can let me. All right. Let's see if I can get rid of this thing. I need some help over here. Anyway, another reason why visualization has become more popular in the past decade or so is the increasing availability of tools, right? We, are many, we have many vendors out there, and all of them produce excellent data visualization. You have Click, you have Jump, you have SAS, you have Tableau, you have Power BI from Microsoft, and many other vendors that produce uh, tools. In my daily work, I use many of those tools and also many others that are open source and free. You may not have heard about them, but I use, for example, D3 sometimes. I use R, the R programming language, I use a tool called Insight and also a, tool, a design tool called Adobe Illustrator. Anyway, so if you want to learn more about any of those tools, um, the organizers of the conference told me that they are going to make these slides available for you later on. If you want to learn about all these tools, you can just go to my website. There is a link to my website over there. All right, and I have tons of free tutorials about all these tools. So tools are also another reason why visualization is becoming more popular because many of these are either free, open source, or if they are not free or open source, they have free versions, such as Tableau, for example, has Tableau Public, Power BI has a free version, Click has a free version, all these tools have a free version. And I believe in most of them are very easy to learn. This is a difference between the beginning of my career and the present time. At the beginning of my career, tools were difficult to access, they were very expensive and difficult to learn. Today, the landscape of visualization has changed completely. Many of these tools are free, and many of them are super, super easy to learn, very, very easy to learn. That has lowered the barrier of entry to the world of data visualization, to the world of charts. And I believe that that is wonderful because I have, I have the belief that data visualization has the potential of becoming a universal language, something that anybody and everybody can take advantage of and learn and so on and so forth. However, and this comes the important part of the talk, I also believe that tools are not enough. I believe that we talk in conferences like these and many others that I present uh, in, we talk too much about how to make visualizations, how to design visualizations. What is the most powerful tool? What is the tool that has most features to design visualization? What is the tool that will let me create this beautiful graphic that I saw the other day in the neotimes.com, right? We talk too much about all those things and we talk too little about how to reason about visualization. And this is a talk and the book related to it is a book also about how to reason, how to think critically about visualizations. And the reason why I think that this is important is that I'm a great believer in the fact that good charts that are well understood can enable conversations. But charts that are badly designed or charts that are well designed but badly interpreted can hinder those same conversations. And I love conversations, all right? I love talking to people and you know, learning new things and I believe that charts can enhance that process or that goal. Throughout my career, teaching visualization and doing visualization for companies and so on and so forth, I have heard many myths that I wish that people would start abandoning. So I'm going to show you so several of those myths or misconceptions in relationship to how we talk often about data visualization. How many times have we heard the myth, a picture is worth a thousand words? That's not true, as I will show you in just one minute. Or the second one, visualization is intuitive. This is very, very dangerous, right? Visualizations often look so clear cut, so well done, that we believe that we interpret them immediately, right? Just in the, glim in, in the blink of an eye. And this can be really, really dangerous. I will show you examples of that later on. Or um, 
the data should speak for itself, right? This is very, very common in, in the business world. The data should speak for itself. Well, data never speaks for itself. You need to make it talk. You need to make it confess, all right? You need to explain what it means, all right? In order to understand what, what, what it is that the data is hiding. Data never speaks for itself. Or this is very common in the world that I come from, the world of journalism and the world of graphic design. Show, don't tell. Well, very often, most often, more often than not, you need to show and tell. Because if you don't tell, then I cannot see what it is that you're trying to show, right? We call in visualization, in the world of news visualization, in journalism visualization, there is a feature of visualization that we tend to call the annotation layer. The annotation layer is basically the title that you put in a visualization, the little annotations, the explainers that you put around your graphic that may put the data in context for people who don't know that much about the data that you're presenting. So we need to show and tell. I usually joke, though, that any of these myths or misconceptions can be made true if we append a second part of the sentence, if you know how to read it. A picture can be worth a thousand words if you know how to read it. But often, and by reading it, I mean not only reading it at the grammatical level, you know, being able to read the axes and the legends, but also at the semantics level, meaning being able to interpret the graphic correctly. And more often than not, we don't know how to do this. And this can be dangerous. Let me tell you a story. Around a year ago, <coughs> three reporters from Reuters met with President Trump in the Oval Office. They were interviewing President Trump about several issues, you know, the uh, trade conflicts with China and many, many other issues. And at some point during the conversation, according to the, uh, the news report that these reporters wrote, President Trump handed them over copies of a certain chart, copies of a certain map in particular. One of the reporters went to CNN the day after for an interview, and he showed the printout of a chart that President Trump had given them throughout the conversation, during the conversation. As you can see, it's a map, a chart, that shows the results of the 2016 presidential election, red for Republican and blue for Democratic. There is a photographic record of the interview, of the uh, taking, a photograph taken by one of the uh, reporters who attended the meeting, actually a photographer, not one of the reporters, with President Trump sitting on the, in the Oval Office and the three printouts of the map in front of him. Um, the map ha is also in the White House. Apparently, right after the 2016 elections, um, several aides in the White House printed out large copies of that chart. They framed them, and now apparently they hang on the walls of the, of the White House at the moment. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, President Trump has tweeted um, a, about, the, about this map. A while ago, there was an interchange between President Trump and several people who oppose him and several people who support him, and so on and so forth, around the Texas primary election. So President Trump tweeted, I want to encourage all my Texas friends to participate in the Texas primary elections, and so on and so forth. And someone who opposes President Trump very strongly replied to President Trump, you have no friends. And then someone who supports President Trump, President Trump replied to this other person who's saying basically, really? Do you think that we don't have friends? Take a look at how many friends we have. And we have the map in there, right? Again, red for Republican and blue for Democratic. And President Trump retweeted this person saying, such a beautiful map. Thank you. Well, the map is really beautiful, but it's also quite, can be really, really misleading if you don't know how to read it correctly. Um, the map has also appeared on book covers. Right after the 2016 election, author Jack Posoviet titled his book, the book that he published right after the election, Citizens for Trump, and we have the map in there again, right? And I like to give free advice to whoever wants to take it, and I try to, try to be as constructive as possible when giving feedback about visualization, and when I saw Posobiec on social media promoting his book, I replied to him, I said, you know, I think that you either should change the title of your book or change the illustration that you have on the book cover, because the title doesn't describe what the map is showing, and the map is not showing what the title says, because the title of your book is Citizens for and I'm going to let me in introduce something here. It doesn't really matter that the book had been called Citizens for Clinton. It will exactly be the same problem, right? The map still doesn't show citizens. The map is not showing citizens. The map is showing territory. So perhaps a better title for your book should be Counties for Trump. Because the amount 
the amounts that are represented over here, the quantities that are represented over here, are not citizens. Remember the whole principle behind data visualization. The whole principle behind data visualization is the proportional representation of numbers to the variation of certain features of certain objects. If you're talking about citizens, you're talking about the popular vote. Therefore, you should not use a map that has 80% of red and 20% of blue, because that is not the percentage of people who voted for President Trump or for candidate Clinton. The uh, a popular vote was a split almost half in half. It was 46%, 48%. And those are the numbers that you need to represent. That map, there is nothing wrong with it. There, the map per se doesn't lie, but we lie to ourselves with it. We tend to project what we want to see onto the charts that we see every day. That is the danger. Because indirectly, that map is conveying the idea of a victory by a landslide. And it was certainly a victory, but it was not a landslide. It was really, really close. The elections were really, really close. All right, so what to do about this, right? What to do with that map, right? That map, again, there's nothing wrong with it, but there's something wrong with the interpretations of that map. Part of the problem is that we are not displaying population density, right? Democratic vote tends to concentrate on big cities, big urban areas, and the, the Republican vote tends to be a little bit more spread out all over the country. And that map doesn't reveal that because we are coloring the entire area of all those counties. It is a great map if the question that we want to answer is who won where? If you want to answer that question, that map works really well for that. But if you want to show people the amount of people who voted for each one of the candidates is not a good map for that. You are misusing the map if you, you are using it for that. My friend Ken Field, who is a cartographer, created an alternative map. On this map, he plotted more than 100 million dots, each one of them corresponding to a citizen who voted, and then he color-coded the citizens according to whether those people voted Republican or voted Democratic or voted for a, a third candidate, and then he geolocated those dots close to where those people voted. And here's where you can see population density at work. Large, vast swaths of territory in the western part of the country are basically empty. That's one of the problems with the, uh, with the map above, right? With the map of the county level, county level vote. But, you know, I'm, I'm not as sophisticated as, as Ken is at creating charts like that. If I had to write a book myself titled Citizens for Whoever, doesn't really matter, Citizens for Clinton, Citizens for Trump, I think that I will stick to just a simple bar graph, right? Just a simple bar graph does the job, right? The bar graph shows you number of people who voted for one candidate, number of people who voted for the other candidate, and then the number of people who voted for a third candidate. However, this also is not a good visualization for a book titled Citizens for Clinton or Citizens for Trump. Why? Well, not all citizens vote. How many people didn't vote in the election? That percentage is actually really, really high. When you take it into consideration, you may entertain the idea of changing your title for citizens for nobody. Because the 40% of possible citizens who could have voted didn't even vote. Actually, the two major candidates, Clinton and Trump, received around one third, close to one third, of the, of the possible votes, right? We could argue that these 40% of people, if they could have voted, would have voted either or for Trump or for Clinton, but the fact is that they didn't vote, and that's a large, the larger group of people, right? So again, if I want to title my book Citizens for Whoever, I would use that kind of chart or these kinds of charts because they better depict what my title says, citizens, not territory. Now let's go back to the map that hangs on the walls of the White House, right? Let's suppose that I run, I run for president. This is not possible, I was born in Spain, so I cannot run for president. I can run for Congress though, right? Which is a good career plan in case that visualization doesn't work out. But anyway, just for the sake of argument, let's suppose that I run for president and I win an election. I, pre I become President Cairo of the United States. And I want to celebrate my victory with a map, with a chart, because I love charts, right? And I love maps. So I want a map on, the, on my White House, right? I would not use any of those because none of those captures what really matters to win a presidential election in the United States. To win a presidential election, the county level vote is not that important. The popular vote is important, but it's secondary. And certainly the amount of territory that you control is not that important. What really matters to win a presidential election in the United States, the metric that is crucial 
to winning a presidential election is the electoral vote. So that's the map that I will put on the walls of my White House, some sort of combination of charts and maps that show the electoral vote, the electoral vote, right? How many voted, how many electors voted for one candidate, how many electors voted for the other candidate, and then two maps, one of them showing the results at the national level, because whoever wins a plurality in a state gets all the electoral votes of that state, in theory. There are always exceptions, but in theory it works that way. And there are a couple of ex exceptions. For example, Maine divides the electoral votes sort of proportionally according to the popular vote. And then another map called a cartogram, the one there on the right, that distorts the areas of the states according to the number of electoral votes that the states contribute to the election. This is a much better chart if you want to celebrate a victory, I believe, as a presidential candidate, regardless of who you are, President Cairo, President Trump, or President Clinton, right? Now, what is the problem here? What we are facing, this, I think that examples like these reveal that we are facing several challenges that may hinder our ability of reading charts. The first one of them, we could call it patternicity, right? We human beings evolve to detect patterns in things that we see, right? Whenever we see data depicted visually, those data depicted as a chart reveal certain patterns. We evolve to see patterns in the landscapes that are in front of our eyes every day. That's super useful, but sometimes detecting those patterns, particularly if we assign meanings to those patterns, can be absolutely dangerous, can be really, really misleading, right? We see a pattern, who won a pattern, who won where, and then we project what we want to believe onto that pattern. That's paternicity at work. How to put paternicity under control? Well, if we become more visually literate, right? there's a word for visual literacy called graphicacy, and one of the challenges that we face, I believe, as a society is e-graphicacy, right? Like illiteracy, but for visual objects. Cartographer Mark Momonier, who has a wonderful book called Mapping It Out, he has several books, but he has one called How to Lie with Maps, which is absolutely wonderful. But he has this book called Mapping It Out, in which he says that today, in order to consider ourselves educated citizens in a democratic republic, we need to have much more than literacy, which is the ability to read and write. We also need the ability to express ourselves verbally, and we call that articulacy. We also ha need to have some sort of skill to think numerically and scientifically, and the word for that is numeracy, which doesn't really equate statistics. It's related to statistics, it's related to mathematics, but it's not statistics alone. Numeracy will be like a sixth sense in the back of your brain that you can develop and train that will ring whenever you see a number or a chart that looks dubious. You take a look at it and say, hmm, there is something fishy about this. I don't know what it is, but it looks strange, okay? And then that prompts you to dig deeper into that chart and see what's going on. You take a look at the source, you take a look at the methodology and so on and so forth, but numeracy is basically that alarm that rings inside your brain whenever you see something that don't work, doesn't work really well. And then finally, graphicacy, which is the ability to read graphics correctly, those graphics that depict data. Now, many graphics that we believe that we read correctly, we really don't. Let me show you an example. Living in Miami, I see this graphic every single year. Every single year, right? This is a map showing where a certain tropical storm or a certain hurricane could go. By the way, this is not Photoshop. Last year, there was a tropical storm called Alberto. And this is a real coincidence. I was writing the chapter about this, this kind of map in the very same days when tropical storm Alberto was approaching the south of, southern part of the United States. And some people, some friends of mine from the University of Miami who knew that I was working on this chapter, they started sending me quotes from the National Hurricane Center related to tropical storm Alberto, copying and pasting, right, a piece of pieces of text from those news reports. My favorite one is, Alberto is not very well organized this morning. <laughs> this is the language that we use to refer to hurricanes in South Florida, right? If a hurricane is very dense and very powerful, we say that it's very well organized. If it is more dispersed, we say that it's disorganized, not very well organized. Well, anyway, everybody, <laughs> believes that he or she or that we can read this map well. Let me tell you, nobody reads this map well, including many scientists. 
However, and regardless, nevertheless, this map is still used by news media. News media gets this map, that cone, and they adapt it, they make it more beautiful, more flashy, they add 3D, add 3D effects to it, and shades, and highlights, and so on and so forth. But the problem is that, and this has been shown through experimental evidence, the problem is that when people, when not everybody, but when many people see that cone, what they see is a possible area under threat. Experimental evidence shows, evidence shows that when people see that cone approaching the United States, what they see is a storm growing in size, right? Possible area that may be affected by the winds of this storm. And there is a very good reason for this, right? Because there is a pictorial resemblance between the shape of the cone and the shape of a hurricane, which is a circular object. So people are making sort of an inference that makes sense. People are not stupid. The problem is that we are not explaining well how to read this map. Man, you don't see many hurricanes over here, but I'm going to explain to you how to read this map in case that you ever entertain the possibility of moving to Florida or when you retire, for example, right? You can come visit me and we can have coffee when you retire. Anyway, so how to read this map, right? This is how to read this map. In order to understand how to read this map, I need to explain to you how the map is created. First of all, the National Hurricane Center collects models, forecasts, created by different agencies, right? And we can imagine those, those models as tons of lines. The center of the hurricane could go here, could go here, could go here, could go there. Those lines represent the possible path of the center of the storm. Then the National Hurricane Center picks the path that they believe that is most likely, right? The one that they estimate that is going to be the most probable path of the storm, right? And they pinpoint the, po the most probable position of the center of the storm in the following X days, usually five, here, 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 and here. And then around those points, they draw circles of increasing size. Those circles represent the level of uncertainty of that forecast. This is all based on past mistakes or successes at predicting the path of storms. And obviously the circle grows in size because it is easier to predict what is going to happen tomorrow than it is to predict what is going to happen five days from now. That's the reason the circle increases in size. And then what they do is basically trace a line that connects all those circles, then they erase those circles, and the result is that cone that obviously is called the cone of uncertainty, the cone of uncertainty. Although people in Florida call it the cone of death. If you're inside the cone, you are under danger. But that is not how to read it. So how to interpret this map? Or if you are a graphic person, and I am increasing your level of graphicacy now, I'm explaining to you, show, don't tell. Well, we, I need to tell to explain how to read this graphic in order to understand it, for you to understand it correctly. Whenever you see that cone, what you need to envision is tons of possible lines of centers of the storm. It could go here, it could go here, it could go here, it could go there. But on top of that, you also need to overlay the likely size of the storm, how big the storm is. So you need to do something like that on your brain. You need to basically imagine how big the storm is and then overlay the size of the storm over the lines that shows you where the storm could go. This is how most scientists and people who know how to read the map read the map, right? But this is still wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, the first time that I saw the cone of uncertainty, I asked myself, does the cone really contain all forecasts that have been made, 100% of possible paths of the storm? And my answer to that question was not that, right? My assumption, the first time that I saw the cone of uncertainty was that whether scientists, climate scientists were telling me, 95% of the time that we see a storm, a tropical storm, Alberto, the path of the storm will be within the boundaries of the cone of uncertainty. It will be inside of the cone. But sometimes we may experience a freak storm, a strange case in which the storm will go outside the boundaries of the cone of uncertainty. Why did I make this assumption? Well, because I remember stats 101, right? I remember p-values and all that crap, and I wrote 95, 5, right? This is how most scientists read this map, but it is still wrong. Because if you, if you read the fine print, if you read how to read the map, which is a section in the National Hurricane Center's website, they will tell you that the cone doesn't contain 95 out of 100 possible paths of the storm. It only contains two out of three. 
why is this surprising or worrying? Because basically they are telling you one out of three times that we experience a storm like Tropical Storm Alberto, the path of the storm will be outside the boundaries of the cone. And one out of three, it doesn't sound like much, but it's a lot, it's a very high probability. I mean, the probability of President Trump's winning the election in 2016 was 33%, according to 538, and he won. So that's a very high probability. So when we see the cone of uncertainty, what we need to educate ourselves in doing is to not to envision a cone, but to envision a Spanish fan, something that is much wider. We can do this mentally. And then on top of that, we need to overlay right, the possible size of the storm to get basically an estimate of wh which areas may be under threat of wind because of this storm. Take a look at how long it took me to understand how to read this map, right? So maps, charts, graphs, visualizations need to be explained to people. Now, if you explain it correctly, the next time that a reader, someone in South Florida that experiences hurricanes every year, next time that that reader sees that cone, she or he will be able to interpret it correctly just because you have explained it to them. This is why it's so important to never assume that a visualization is intuitive or that a visualization is self-explanatory or that data speaks for itself. The data never speaks for itself. Another problem that may hinder our interpretation of data is our fear of complexity. This is very, very common in the world that I come from, the world of journalism. In the world of journalism, if you ask journalists to describe what journalism, co journalism consists of, they will explain to you, well, public service, providing information. But one of the things that they will tell you is that my role is to simplify information because the world is so complex. My, my, my goal is to simplify information for readers. I don't like to use the word or the verb to simplify. I think that the verb to simplify can be really, really dangerous. I prefer to use the verb to clarify. Because when we talk about simplification, that will bias our process when creating a visualization to always try to minimize the amount of data that we present. And that's a worthy goal. Sometimes that's the right thing to do. But sometimes we may go too far. We may discard too much data that may be incredibly important to understanding what's going on. Sometimes we need not to decrease the amount of data that we show, we need to increase the amount of data that we show, not to simplify, but to clarify a story. That's a simplification. There is nothing wrong with that chart, again, this, this is geometrically speaking, mathematically speaking, design-wise, there is nothing wrong with this chart. This is a chart that is showing murder rates per 100,000 people in the United States. We have all heard the story. In the 80s, the murder rate in the United States increased very dramatically. Then it went down during the 90s, stayed more or less the same during the 2000s. And then in the past two or three years, the murder rate has started increasing again. If you prolong this line, if you extend this line a little bit further, closer to the present, the line continues increasing. That's an important conversation. Remember what I said before? Charts can enable conversations, right? We need to have a conversation about that. What's going on? How we, do we address this problem, right? The fact that the murder rate is increasing. Well, I can tell you that this chart is not enough because it's a simplification. Why? Well, I live in Miami, <laughs> South Miami. In my neighborhood, there has been one murder in the past six or seven years. That means that my neighborhood, if I could plot it in that chart, it will be close to the baseline. And most places in the United States, more cities, more neighborhoods, most towns are very, very safe. I lived in Brazil. I know what dangerous means, right? Uh, for a few years, I lived in Brazil. But anyway, the, the problem with this chart is that if you see it on its own and you don't, you're not able to go beyond the chart, what this chart is indirectly telling you is that the United States is becoming a more dangerous country. And that is not true. That is not true because most places are down there. If we could plot every single town, city, according to statisticians who work with crime statistics, if we can plot every single place in the United States, most places will be down there. What is the problem? Outliers. There are certain places in the United States that in the past five, six years or so, have become so dangerous, so, so dangerous, so violent, that if we try to plot them on the chart, they will go through the roof. They will go off the scale, right, way off scale to the sky. But those things, those outliers are distorting the national rate. Therefore, if we want to have a conversation about how to 
address the problem of murders, of violent crime in general in the United States, we need to go beyond what the original chart was showing. The chart alone was a simplification. The chart plus that explanation is a clarification because once you know that, you will be able to target those specific places, not to try to evenly distribute your resources all over the United States. So never try to simplify, always try to clarify, always try to think about what is the right level of granularity that I need to present in order to tell a compelling but also truthful story. There are several levels at which we can present data, right? We can use just summary statistics alone, or we can visualize more and more data. We need to find what is the right level of detail that we need to tell a story. And certainly the original graphic here was not the right level of detail because we need to know about this fact. It is critical to understanding what's going on. Related to the fear of complexity, I could also talk about the problem with uncertainty, right? We journalists, we don't like uncertainty. We never show uncertainty. And this could be a problem in many cases, in many, many different cases. Back in 2014, El País, which is the, sec the, the first, the most important newspaper in Spain, published that headline saying that Catalan public opinion swings towards no to independence. A little bit of backstory. There is a region in Spain called Catalonia. There has been an independence movement over there, right? Half of the population is in favor to independence, Catalonia becoming an independent country. And the other half of Catalonia wants Catalonia to remain being part of Spain, right? There's an ongoing debate. The thing is that the Catalonian government conducts a survey every year and they ask Catalonians many questions. One of them is, do you want Catalonia to be an independent country or do you want Catalonia to remain as part of Spain, right? And they ask that question every year. And El País was titling, the no to independence is bigger than the yes to independence, according to this survey. Is that true? Well, let's take a look at the data. It seems that it's true, right? The percent of people who say no to independence is 45%. And the people who say yes to independence is 44% point something. And then we have people who are undecided. But it seems to be true that no to independence is bigger than yes to independence. Unless that you read the fine print. The reporter who wrote this story in El Pais, for El Pais, wrote in one of the paragraphs of the story, the margin of error of this poll is three percentage point. A relevant fact considering how close the yes and the no are in the survey. Well, that's sort of an insult, right? Because it's basically telling you, this is all crap, right? <laughs> I, I say, how is this even possible? You're telling me that your, your headline is completely wrong, right? Because of course it is a relevant fact. It is so relevant that I would say, being sort of a wary, careful journalist, I would say that you cannot claim that the no is bigger than the yes, or that the yes is bigger than the no. What you can say, and stay in the safe zone, is that they are tied. Just because the, the distance between them could be due just to, you know, sample error, for example, because the confidence interval is so wide, so, so wide. What is the challenge? The challenge is that we never, in journalism, in journalism in particular, we rarely consider uncertainty when visualizing our data. And sometimes uncertainty is really important. If the no and the yes were 85%, 15%, then the margin of error would not be that important. But when the no and the yes are so close to each other, and moreover, when you have 10% of people who have no opinion, that also adds to the uncertainty, you need to disclose the uncertainty, you need to discuss it, and you need to basically curb your impulses you know, for, a, for a, an eye-catching headline. You cannot claim that one is bigger than the other. All that you can say, I would say, is that they seem to be tied. There are different methods to visualize uncertainty, and we need to explore them a little bit more, or at least we need to discuss it particularly particularly when the presence of uncertainty may change our interpretation of the data completely, like in this particular case. Challenge number five out of seven in terms of misinterpreting charts or that may hinder the interpretation of charts is how much we like to see our opinions being confirmed, right? We like, we, we call these, cognitive scientists call these the confirmation bias. There's a growing literature in cognitive science talking about, uh, talking about this. Yeah, we have the famous Thinking Fast and Slow, which is a great, a great book. And we also have this one. This is one of my favorites. Right? This is one of my favorite introductions to cognitive bias, cognitive bias ever published. I greatly recommend it, right? Mistakes were made, but not by me. I never made mistakes. We all believe that, right? We all believe that. And we are wrong. We all make mistakes, obviously, and we all tend to project what we want to believe onto the charts that we see every day. Let me show you an example. Let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, that any of you, one of you, is uh, a heavy 
smoker, a heavy cigarette smoker. You smoke like 40 cigarettes every day. And your family, you have grown tired, exhausted of hearing your family tell you, you need to stop smoking because smoking is going to kill you, it's going to shorten your life. And you say, but I really like smoking, I want to keep smoking, right? I want to find a justification to keep smoking, you're telling yourself, right? And suddenly one day, Professor Alberto Cairo from the University of Miami shows you a chart that, is, that shows, that displays, that proves that smoking is great for your health. Take a look at that. That chart is showing that there is a positive, quite a strong association between cigarette consumption and life expectancy. And if you are a lay reader, not trained in data science or statistics or science in general, the way that you will read this chart is the more cigarettes I smoke, the longer my life expectancy will be. That's the way that we all tend to read this kind of chart. And let me tell you, one of the things that worry me the most about reading charts correctly is the way that we verbalize them, the way that we describe the content of a chart, right? I have made this mistake myself, describing charts like this as more cigarettes, more life expectancy. That is not the right way to describe the content of this chart. All this chart is showing is that, and this is the right way to verbalize it, at the national level, there is a positive association, I would not say correlation because the relationship is not is entirely linear, but a positive association between cigarette consumption and life expectancy. But that doesn't mean that more cigarettes lead to more life expectancy, obviously, right? Why not? Because we are not considering the role of, you know, unknown variables, right? For example, wealth, right? Perhaps the wealthier a country is, the more cigarettes people tend to consume in those countries, but also the more money those same people can invest in better health care and in better diet, right? So the bad effects of smoking are weighed, are balanced out by better health care and better diets and more exercise, et cetera, and a safer environment, right? So perhaps that relationship is related to wealth only, right? How do we prove that? Well, if we disaggregate the data, we may start seeing that this relationship completely disappears because this is an example of what statisticians like to call an amalgamation paradox or Simpson's paradox. An association that you will see at a certain level of, of aggregation may disappear or completely reverse when you start disaggregating the data at lower levels, right? So it's related to that amalgamation paradox. And it is also related to a very, very, very important fallacy, right? That we all commit, all of us commit, called the ecological fallacy. The ecological fallacy basically and simply put says that you cannot make an inference at a certain level of aggregation, or you should be very careful of doing that, making an inference at a certain level of aggregation when you take a look at data that is aggregated at a completely different level. You are trying to make an inference at the individual level. Is cigarette consumption good for me? but you are taking a look at the data at the national level, and that may not be true. Because once we start disaggregating the data, I'm going to start color coding these countries according to uh, wealth, and I'm going to separate them. I'm going to create three, three scatter plots instead of one. For each one of these income groups, the relationship basically disappears. It's gone. The association is much weaker. And I'm pretty sure that if we could disaggregate data more and more at the local level, regional level, neighborhood level, and so on and so forth, the relationship will start reversing. And I know that because if we go to the individual level, person by person, we have good evidence that shows that smoking is really bad, right? This is a survival curve chart that shows that people who don't smoke tend to live much longer than people who smoke. This is the right level of aggregation if you want to make an inference that applies to you, not to the country where you live, right? But still, if you're a smoker, you may feel tempted to use this chart to basically show to your family and say, stop bugging me, smoking is good for me. Why do we do that? Because we all love to rationalize. This same literature on cognitive science shows that the human brain, it seems, didn't evolve to reason. Right? We didn't evolve to discover how the world works. We need to train ourselves to do that. What we did evolve for is to basically confirm our existing opinions and then learn how to argue our opinions in front of others, how to persuade other people that our opinions are right so we can attract them to our own tribe. 
and that is called rationalization. If you want to learn about that, there is a wonderful, wonderful book titled The Enigma of Reason, which should have been titled The Enigma of Rationalization, because it's all about rationalization. It also discusses a little bit how we can curb that impulse, how we can not always, because it is impossible to do this always, but more and more try to curb our impulse, our liking for rationalizations, and transform that into an impulse for reasoning about the information that we see every day. Let me show you a chart that was used to rationalize an opinion. A while ago, I witnessed a debate about the Affordable Care Act, right? The Affordable Care Act was passed a number of years ago. Conservatives don't like it, liberals love it, and so on and so forth. There has been an ongoing debate, right? Liberals say that, and progressives say that the Affordable Care Act is great because more people can have health care. Uh, they also say that the, uh, the Affordable Care Act is great for the job market because it helps people become freelancers, or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, conservatives, on the other hand, say that the Affordable Care Act is really bad because it burdens companies, it hinders the ability of companies hiring more people by forcing them to provide more health care, and so on and so forth. I don't have an opinion. I don't have enough information to have an opinion, and I don't care what you think about the Affordable Care Act. That's besides the point. However, I once saw several liberal commentators using this chart to prove that the Affordable Care Act is great for the job market. Because they were saying, well, if you take a look at the number of jobs created in the private economy, that number of jobs plunged during the uh, economic crisis, and then it started increasing. And if we could extend this line further, the number of jobs created has kept increasing and increasing and increasing. That's great news. And they said, take a look at what happened over here, very close to where the curve is changing direction. The Affordable Care Act was passed, implying that the Affordable Care Act has had something to do with the change of direction of the curve, or that it was not hindering the ability of companies to hire um, a more and more people. Here is a rule of thumb that we all need to basically, I don't know, I would say tattoo on our arms and always keep it over here, which is a chart shows only what it shows and nothing else. Everything that you see on a chart, everything else that you see on a chart is not on the chart itself. It happens in your brain. You're projecting. The chart is only showing you that there is a coin, sort of a coincidence in time between the change of direction of the curve and the passing of Obamacare. But if you try to reason instead of rationalize, you may think about possible alternative explanations to this fact, to the change of direction. For example, I could say, you know, um, President Obama passed the stimulus package in February 2009, and then perhaps those billions of dollars that got injected in the private market pushed companies to start hiring more rapidly, and that's what actually explains the change of direction of the curve. I don't know. I'm not an economist. But that's a plausible explanation. Moreover, we could train ourselves to think a little bit more about counterfactuals, alternative scenarios. What would have happened if Obamacare was never passed? What about the, Affo the Affordable Care Act had never been approved or had gotten killed by the Supreme Court, which was a possibility at the time? How would that curve look like? Would it look like that, meaning that the Affordable Care Act had, has no influence whatsoever on hiring, right? Because the, 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 the Affordable, Care will, Car Affordable Care Act will not be there. Or would it look like that, meaning that the Affordable Care Act does have a negative influence over companies because the curve will look much steeper going up, right? Or would the, afford would the curve look like that, meaning that the Affordable Care Act has a good influence on the job market? We don't know because the chart shows only what it shows and nothing else. This example leads me to the last challenge that I believe that is critical to creating a better informational environment. Let me tell you, let me disclose a little bit about this. I am the kind of person who would retweet or post on Facebook the original chart mindlessly. Why? Because I like the Affordable Care Act. I'm from Spain. We have socialized medicine, and it works really well over there. It's cheaper, it's very effective than the United States, at least in my opinion and in my experience. So I am the kind of person who sees that chart and says a person's claiming that the Affordable Care, Care Act is great for the job market, and if I, if I didn't know better or if I didn't think twice, I would retweet that and I would put that in, on Facebook. We need to curb that impulse, regardless of what our ideological orientation is, because we all have a moral responsibility to create better informational environments. In the past few years, there has been an increase in the literature about critical thinking and numerical thinking. There has been several books being published in the past few years about how to think better 
about data, right? We have bad science about Bengal Dacre, which is a wonderful introduction to statistical thinking. We have How Not to Be Wrong, which is written by a mathematician, great introduction to mathematics or mathematical reasoning. We have Naked Statistics, which is a great introduction to stats without formulas. Yes, the conceptual level of stats. We see all these books coming out on a regular basis. They are all wonderful, but I believe that they lack two very important things. First of all, they rarely address charts, which is a great opportunity for me because I have my own niche, right? And my own book will basically fit in there somehow. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that they don't address the ethical dimension. And here's what I mean. Stats, science, math, charts, they are tools. If there is something that distinguishes the human species from other animal species, it's not our ability to speak or to write. Because writing, language, is a tool. What distinguishes us from other animal species is our ability to develop cognitive tools that expand our knowledge, that expand our vision, that expand our intelligence. We create those conceptual tools on a regular basis. The scientific method, or the methods, that's a tool. It's a tool that basically help us guide our intuitions and put our intuitions under control. Statistics is also that kind of tool. As an extension of that, charts, the world that I deal with every single day, they are also tools. And those tools are not that different to a hammer. A hammer is a tool right, that can be used for good and for ill. It can be used to build things. It can be used to build housing. It can be used to build you know, shelter for the poor and so on and so forth. But the exact same, the same way, by the way, that a chart can be used to build understanding. But the exact same tool, the exact same method, can also be used for the opposite purpose. It can be used to destroy houses or to destroy shelters. The same way that charts, if they are misused, or charts, if they are misread, they can also be used to destroy understanding. And we all have a responsibility not this, to avoid this to happen. There is a shared responsibility, I believe, to try to create better informational environments. There's a great need in this country, and also in other countries that I'm familiar with, to do this, to try to create better informational environments. You, I, have a responsibility as creators of tools, right? We have the responsibility to create charts that enable conversations and not charts that hinder or destroy those conversations. And this is usually contemplated in the literature about stats, math, etc., etc. What is not discussed, though, is the responsibility on the part of the reader. And this is the whole reason why I said before, this Affordable Care Act chart is the kind of thing that I would retweet mindlessly. I am a reader. I have a responsibility not to do that. I have a responsibility to take a second look at the chart, take a look at the data, you know, think about the data before I post it in social media, and not yield into my impulse to put online, to share with my network and my community, things that confirm my own opinion, just because they confirm my own opinion. There is also responsibility on the part of readers right, to think twice about what it is that we see and what it is that we are going to share over our networks. Because again, we all have a responsibility, I believe, to create a better society and a more informed citizenry. Thank you so much.